Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so today we're going to talk about newcomer South Asian communities in Toronto and prevalence of diabetes. Um, uh, uh, we are here uh, from South Asian Diabetes Prevention Program at Flemington Health Center. Um, we're going to talk about uh, South Asian Diabetes Prevention Program, the program that we're um, part of, and uh, we're going to have a little bit of diabetes awareness part. Uh, and then uh, my colleague Neelam is going to talk about coping with stress, um, as it is one of the risk factors for diabetes. So the first part is diabetes, uh, South Asian Diabetes Prevention Program. Um, and this is the team that works. Uh, we call the team SATP in short, South Asian Diabetes Prevention Program. My name is Masuma Jafari. I'm the events and communications specialist with the team. Um, uh, and uh, our colleague, Anna, um, couldn't be here. She is a dietitian with the team. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to my lovely colleague, Neelam, now uh, to, mm -hmm. to introduce herself. Thank you, Masuma. So good morning, everyone. Um, happy World Diabetes Day. I would say happy because uh, today we did uh, come across, um, you know, rediscovering of uh, insulin, which is great. And um, I want to introduce myself. So I am Neelam Charanya. I'm a registered nurse with the South Asian Diabetes Prevention Program. Um, I am uh, an immigrant, I'm in South Asian, I'm at high risk for developing diabetes and coming across this program, working for this program now for uh, more than five years. Um, we see our clients from our community, from North York, from um, in Scarborough, in Toronto, we go as far as Brampton, Nisaga, uh, Ajax, Pickering in the East, and we do see newcomers, we do see South Asians um, on day-to-day -day basis as we are mobile clinic. Um, and it's really, um, it really touches us to know that how our clients are open to understand. Um, and they are like looking forward to learn about diabetes prevention. So that's a good part. And then uh, there's so much more work needs to be done um, in terms of diabetes prevention. So today we are looking forward to connecting with you throughout the session. We'll learn about diabetes awareness, um, stress management, how we can support our clients and uh, um, support ourselves as a service providers. So I'm looking forward to um, the session together. Over to you, Masima. Thank you, Nila. So yeah, just before I go ahead, um, I'm a South Asian too, and I'm also at high risk for developing diabetes. Um, Okay, so let's start with the question um, of, are we at risk even if our blood sugar levels are, are normal? Um, um, and the answer is yes. Um, if you look at the tip of the iceberg, which is the blood sugar level, uh, um, uh, it's, uh, the, I mean, we're, we're uh, ignoring all the additional risk factors, the hidden factors that can put us at risk and increase our uh, um, risk for developing diabetes. Uh, one of the risk factors could be genetics, the hidden risk factors. Let's learn about more of them uh, today uh, and how to uh, prevent them. So um, here uh, I'm gonna talk about CAN risk um, and ethnicity uh, criteria. Um, CAN risk is an evidence-based tool uh, which is used for, um, uh, it is a, a, basically a questionnaire that uh, have uh, different criteria. Uh, for example, age, ethnicity, um, BMI, body mass index, uh, weight measurements, height, um, many, many criteria. So based on that, uh, um, based on those questions, um, you can find out what is your risk for developing diabetes. So here I'm highlighting ethnicity, the criteria is ethnicity, and the scale that we have um, to show the risk is between 0 to 11. Um, you can see 0 to 3 is low risk, 4 to 7 is moderate, and 8 to 11 is high risk. Um, so looking at uh, the can risk points for different ethnicities, um, you can see that if somebody belongs to a white ethnicity, their can risk point um, uh, is zero. The risk for developing diabetes according to can risk is zero. If somebody belongs to indigenous uh, ethnicity, their risk for developing diabetes according to can risk is three. 
again, low in low range. Um, black, uh, if somebody belongs to black communities, uh, the risk for developing diabetes according to their ethnicity is five. Uh, remember that we're talking about ethnicity and genes here. East Asian, 10, high. Um, other non-white people, uh, it is three. Um, again, low. Uh, but if you're South Asian, uh, countries like Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Tibet, then according to CanRisk, you have the highest risk for developing diabetes. Um, 11 was the highest. Um, so uh, as I said before, one of the um, one of the hidden risk factors for developing diabetes is um, ethnicity. Uh, our genetics, our risk, uh, our, our genes put us at higher risk for developing diabetes. So evidence uh, shows that um, uh, compared to um, Canada's general population, we have uh, about three times um, more of South Asian uh, populations that are uh, living with type 2 diabetes. 14.4% uh, of Canada's South Asian population live with um, type 2 diabetes um, uh, compared to 5% of Canada's general population that lives with type 2 diabetes. Uh, why South Asians are at greater risk for diabetes? There are um, two uh, type of uh, factors, risk factors. Uh, we have non-modifiable risk factors, which are mainly genetic. Um, our ethnicity, our genes uh, increase our risk for developing diabetes. We cannot um, really do anything about it. Um, uh, but there are other factors as well, which are modifiable. Uh, the things that we can uh, control, we can manage, lifestyle factors, for example, are diet, our physical activity habits, um, uh, our stress management. Um, uh, a lot of the time people have unhealthy coping mechanism for stress that put them at higher risk for developing diabetes or even um, uh, coping with a stress put us, uh, causes our body to um, release um, different hormones that can uh, increase our risk for developing diabetes. Similar to the stress, uh, physical activity and diet, as I mentioned, can be the modifiable um, lifestyle factors. So about the South Asian Diabetes Prevention Program, or SATB, uh, the SATB model was developed by Flemington Health Center in, in 2009. Uh, the overall goal uh, for the program was to enhance equitable access to upstream diabetes prevention services and to provide culturally re relevant and language-specific education and resources for South Asian communities within the GTA. Um, and uh, our programs um, are now both in person and virtually. Um, and uh, we are uh, kind of a mobile clinic. We go to different communities. Um, we work with different stakeholders and they provide us with the space. Sometimes they do the promotion as well. They have, they already have clients and they have a group of people who come, for example, to their um, center every week. Um, and uh, so we go there and we have our workshop there and help people to prevent diabetes, to learn about diabetes prevention. So what are the eight countries uh, that we focus on um, and we consider them as part of South Asia? Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Tibet. Uh, and people in, in these countries um, speak languages like Bangla, Dari, Gujarati, Hindi, Nepali, Punjabi, uh, Sinhala, Tamil, Telugu, Tibetan, Urdu, and many other regional languages that we can uh, provide support for. Uh, we have uh, some of these languages, we have the support already within the team, uh, but for the others, if the clients um, show us the need, we can uh, arrange the interpretation services for them. Um, so, um, who is SAT before? When we talk about diabetes prevention, we're talking about healthy individuals who do not have diabetes. So our program is focused on people with no diabetes uh, who are from South Asian country of origin. Um, I mentioned the countries before and uh, they speak uh, South Asian languages um, and they're adults 18 or older. Sometimes we have younger um, 
um, clients as well. It's okay. It's uh, we, we believe it's better to know about diabetes and be aware of diabetes as early as possible to take action. Um, and uh, so these clients have uh, blood sugar levels uh, or th their blood sugar levels are normal. Uh, if they are pre-diabetic already or have diabetes uh, or diabetes with complications, then we have another program which is called Diabetes Education Program, and we can refer them to um, those programs. Um, also, I want to mention something else here because I uh, so our program is called South Asian Diabetes Prevention Program. We're focused on South Asian communities uh, because of the higher uh, risk for them uh, to develop diabetes. Uh, however, if we go to a community and we have clients from other, um, we have some clients from other ethnicities, uh, it's okay, we're not exclusive. Uh, we can include them uh, as long as we have our uh, South Asian clients as well. Um, and uh, yeah, the main goal is to prevent diabetes. We don't want people to get diabetes. Okay, so what are the benefits of uh, SADP to South Asian clients? Our program is culturally relevant and language specific. We can provide uh, language support, as I mentioned before, uh, and we have group education, skill building sessions. Uh, participants will learn about uh, their risk level for developing diabetes early, uh, and they can take action to prevent uh, diabetes, to delay diabetes. Uh, uh, we uh, in each uh, workshop when we go to communities, we have uh, some of the clients who are recognized as high risk, and then we will follow up with them. Uh, we try to engage them and uh, make an action plan for them to um, to uh, try to take action and um, start working on preventing diabetes. Um, and our clients can start uh, making lifestyle changes um, early enough to prevent diabetes. Uh, we have uh, both in-person and virtual sessions, as, as I mentioned before. So here I'm explaining uh, our um, classic uh, workshop series that we have, um, the, the in-person one. We have four sessions. Um, uh, these are weekly sessions. Uh, the first session is called Early Detection Clinic. In this session, uh, we um, provide one-on-one um, -on -one, um, individual risk assessment, diabetes risk assessment for, uh, for our clients. Uh, and uh, we also provide a diabetes awareness presentation. We talk about uh, uh, diabetes, uh, different types of diabetes, risk factors for diabetes. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about um, that part a little bit. And today's presentation is very informative, um, and uh, there are a lot of myths about diabetes, so it's good to uh, learn about diabetes and what diabetes is. Um, uh, but we also do risk assessment here, and people will understand what is the risk um, uh, risk for developing diabetes. Uh, and uh, the risk assessment tool that we use, um, we have can risk as well. We use it for our clients who are not South Asians, um, but we, are, we have our own uh, um, questionnaire tool, which is tailored to South Asian uh, clients. And we use that one. Um, it, it's not very invasive. We don't do blood tests. It's um, based on questionnaire and questions about um, uh, diet, habits, uh, physical activity routines. We do some measurements, height, weight, uh, and waist circumference and things like that. Um, but yeah, but, but our clients will have an understanding of uh, the risk level for developing diabetes by the end of the first session. In the second session, we uh, talk about healthy eating to um, help the participants to um, understand about healthy food choices. Uh, they will um, learn how to read uh, nutrition labels when they go to uh, uh, when they, when they go uh, grocery shopping. Uh, to know what they're eating. Um, in third session, we're going to talk about coping with stress uh, to prevent diabetes. As I said before, stress is one of uh, the risk factors for developing diabetes. Today, Neelam is going to talk about that a little bit as well. Um, uh, but yeah, third session is all about stress management to prevent diabetes and healthy coping mechanism for mechanisms for stress. Um, the fourth session is about uh, physical activity and Goal setting, uh, we um, uh, try to help participants to uh, learn some physical activity uh, moves, uh, some some of the things that they can um, do at home as well. 
uh, so that uh, they stay active. Um, and we um, we uh, encourage them to start with baby steps. Uh, they don't need to go like um, start the, um, the first day. Like they, they don't need to have a gym membership the first day. They can start at home with baby steps and try to uh, change their lifestyle from sedentary to um, active lifestyle. So how you can how can you support your clients with gaining access to SATP programs? Um, there are many ways. Uh, you can recommend SATP to South Asian clients who are not living with diabetes, and you can support them uh, with signing up as needed. Uh, we can provide you uh, with flyers, um, digital or printed flyers, and you can provide them to your uh, clients. Um, and you can refer them directly to us. Uh, we're gonna stay in touch after this uh, webinar today and uh, you can refer your clients uh, to us. Um, uh, you can also collaborate with our team uh, by providing workshop space. If you have a group of clients uh, who can uh, benefit from our program, uh, you can uh, get in touch with us. We can arrange uh, a date and time and uh, we will provide the workshop for them. Uh, um, for our workshop, uh, the main thing that we ask um, our stakeholders is uh, the workshop space. We will need um, maybe, uh, well, uh, depending on the number of uh, clients, we'll need a, a room, uh, one or two rooms, and uh, we will bring all the equipments and other um, and things, uh, materials for the workshop, and we'll have the workshop for your clients. Uh, we also have a general flyer, um, uh, which I can share with you after the session. Um, and if you are interested and you want to stay in touch, you can um, scan the barcode here. There's a form, um, an expression of interest form. You can um, be in the list and receive updates about our uh, future programs. Uh, so the program that I showed you, that was the classic workshop that we have uh, when we go to community, but we also have other programs um, with the topics of healthy eating, physical activity. Uh, we recently finished um, uh, one uh, program, which was called Grocery Store Tour. Our dietitian would take um, people to grocery stores and uh, show them what are the healthy options and how to read nutrition labels. So we have uh, many different programs which could help uh, people with um, diabetes prevention. Um, so if you stay in touch with us, then you will uh, hear about them. Okay, so now uh, we come to the second part, which is diabetes awareness. Uh, now you know about the South Asian Diabetes Prevention Program and how to um, uh, get in touch with us. Uh, let's learn um, about diabetes. So I have a question here. Um, can, can can you tell me what you know about diabetes already? Anyone? Uh, you can also put in the chat if you have a response. When you hear diabetes, what comes to your mind? May I participate? <laughs> yes. When I hear diabetes, I'm scared because every single person in my family has diabetes. All my ancestors, everyone. Yeah, that's... I'm, I'm Bengali. And so it's just uh, genetically, um, everyone is just predispositioned to it. So diabetes raises some fear within me when I hear that word. Yeah, thank you, Misha. Um, anybody else? Uh, I I would also have to agree with Misha Mike grandmother's diabetic and my mom is pre-diabetic so there's definitely like that concern of like oh if you get diabetes like that's for life right there's like from what I understand there's no cure for it or like there's nothing you can do except sustain like like take medication for like insulin yeah. and stuff right manage it yeah yeah um yeah thank you so much so uh yeah um yeah, it's a scary word. When, whenever I hear diabetes, I'm scared too. My mom has diabetes. Um, a lot of us uh, come with family history, which is a risk factor. And as I said, um, uh, from like according to our ethnicity, we are already at risk for developing diabetes. Yeah, yeah when um, a lot of them, when I ask this question, people talk about the sugar, sugar level. But yeah, I, I love that you talked about the, um, the fear um, of the word diabetes, yeah. 
Uh, okay, so let's learn about types of diabetes. Sorry, I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, I was just, um, I have family members with diabetes as well. And one of the things that I find with South Asians is doctors don't always counsel on other options other than just medication, or they'll say just lose weight, but they're not actually coaching or guiding on how to do so. Um, and they'll tell people to exercise, but you know, when they move here, life is so different here. So yeah. not only do they not have access to services, they don't understand how to do that. And the food here, the options for food here is so different too. So I feel like not only are we more at risk, but we're also not counseled properly and we're kind of slipping through the cracks of the healthcare system. So I love that this program exists and yeah, I'd love to collaborate on ways we can better support our South Asian community, including our families. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, our program is actually very focused on newcomers. Uh, and uh, because the three uh, factors that I mentioned before, diet, um, physical activity, routine, and stress, all of these come into uh, uh, place when, uh, come into play when um, uh, people are new in a country. We don't know where to get um, food, healthy food options for example uh we're new we go through a lot of stress uh we um we don't have a good physical activity routine because of the access issues as you mentioned um and so yeah thank you so much for mentioning that um we have uh, three types of diabetes um type one diabetes type one diabetes type two and gestational diabetes we're gonna learn about them um today Type 1 diabetes. Uh, in type 1 diabetes, people have um, almost no insulin in their body. And uh, this type uh, usually happens in people younger than 30 years old. Uh, this is only treated by insulin. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you have heard of insulin. Insulin is the hormone in the body that controls uh, blood sugar levels. Uh, and um, uh, when we don't have insulin in our body, then we have to get it as a medication from outside. Um, so this is what happens with type 1 diabetes. And this is uh, only 10% of all diabetes um, uh, and cannot be prevented. This is um, the, uh, luckily it's only 10% and it's, it cannot be prevented, it's mainly genetic. Uh, and this is not the focus of uh, um, the diabetes prevention when we talk about diabetes prevention. So now we come to type 2 diabetes. Um, in type 2 diabetes, we don't have enough uh, insulin or our insulin does not work properly in our body. Um, the, for, the, the risk for type 2 diabetes uh, uh, is getting higher but as we age, um, and um, uh, especially with South Asian clients because of the, their uh, genetic factors that they already are at risk. Um, this one can be treated with medication uh, and lifestyle. Um, when I say treated, it means to manage it uh, with medications and lifestyle uh, changes. Uh, this is the most common type of diabetes. 90% of all diabetes is um, type 2 diabetes and can be prevented or delayed. So the focus of uh, diabetes prevention when we talk about diabetes prevention is type 2 diabetes. Okay, the last one is gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is the diabetes that affects women during pregnancy. Um, uh, this one can um, be temporary or it can stay uh, with women after pregnancy as well. Um, but the important thing here is that it can uh, increase uh, um, the risk for developing type 2 diabetes later. So if somebody has uh, diabetes during pregnancy, they have to be more careful about the things that they can control, lifestyle uh, factors that they can control to prevent type 2 diabetes. Okay, so let's see what happens in the body um, when we eat uh, in a normal body situation first, and then we're going to go to the diabetic body. Uh, when uh, we have a normal body, everything works well, everything is functioning well, uh, we eat, we have uh, the sugar molecules here in our stomach, um, the purple circles here, and the pancreas is the organ that uh, releases insulin, uh, the insulin here is shown as keys, uh, these green keys, uh, so we have um, uh, sugar molecules 
the insulin uh, is released, the sugar molecules and the insulin go to the bloodstream. And uh, the these keys or the insulin, uh, which helps regulate uh, blood sugar level, they help the sugar molecules to get into the cell here. And then we use the, uh, the sugar or the energy um, as energy inside our cells, we use them and our body um, can function. We can be active and we're using the sugar as energy here. Okay, so everything is working properly. The insulin is helping the sugar molecules get into the cell. And we're using the uh, sugar molecules as uh, energy here. What happens when we get diabetes? Diabetes type two, we're talking about type two. Um, again, we eat, we have the sugar molecules in our stomach, they go to the bloodstream. The pancreas um, tries to release insulin, uh, but as I mentioned before, we don't have enough of the insulin, right? We don't have enough here, so uh, we cannot get all the sugar molecules into the cell because it, we don't have enough keys or enough insulin. Or uh, the insulin is not working properly. As you can see here, the shape of this key is different. So it's not uh, really helping uh, to get the sugar molecules into the cell. Our cells are actually starving here. Um, and uh, we have a high blood sugar level, as you can see. And the sugar uh, that does not belong in the bloodstream. It's not supposed to be there for long. It's supposed to be there and then get into the cell, be used as energy so that we can be active. Um, when it's like that, it can hurt our body when we have a uh, high blood sugar level can hurt our body. So this is what happens in a diabetic body. And this is a normal body situation. Um, does anybody have any question here? Uh, I'm not checking the chat, but if you wanted to ask a question, you can put it in the chat and we can answer later as well. Mm -hmm. I'm checking the chat box, Masama, in the background. And okay, there are thank you. a lot of good questions. So thank you all for participating. Thank you, Nilam. Uh, okay, so yeah, let's move on. Uh, so we, we don't have diabetes. Everything is good. And um, a lot of us um, are not aware that we have to take action um, about like, being about preventing diabetes, right? Then we go to pre-diabetes. We get some warning signs. Our physician might tell us uh, you have um, uh, borderline um, high blood sugar level. Uh, so, th so the good thing about prediabetes um, is that it can be prevented, uh, but it takes so much effort. Uh, most of the times, uh, more than half of the people who get prediabetes, they're going to develop diabetes uh, at the end. Um, but, but, but still, we can prevent it by different lifestyle changes, losing weight if possible, because sometimes losing weight is not possible uh, either. Eating healthy, balanced diet, um, managing stress, and being more active. Um, so if we act early enough with no diabetes, it's much easier to prevent diabetes. If we are already pre-diabetic, uh, still preventable, um, but a little bit difficult. If we get diabetes, it cannot be cured. We can't. We cannot reverse it. Um, however, uh, it can be managed. Uh, we can change our diet, lifestyle. Uh, we can make some lifestyle changes, and we uh, we um, take some medications to control our blood sugar levels. Okay, what are some signs and symptoms of diabetes? Uh, the first one, I'm sure everybody knows about this one, is frequent urination. Um, which is related to uh, that slide when I was explaining what happens in the body. So we have high blood sugar level. Uh, our body is trying to get rid of the uh, extra sugar. So we urinate a lot. We have frequent urination. And then we feel very thirsty. Um, again, related to that. When we urinate a lot, we need more water, right? We are thirsty. Uh, weight change. Remember I said that our cells are actually starving. We're not getting sugar into the cells. So our body is using a lot of the stored energy. Uh, so we see a sudden weight change if we have high blood sugar level. If our body is not able to control our sugar level, then we see a sudden weight change, uh, weight loss. Lack of energy. Again, 
the cells are starving. We're not getting the sugar um, into the cells to use uh, as energy. So we don't have energy, right? Uh, I have to mention here that if somebody has these signs and symptoms, it's kind of late to think about diabetes prevention. Uh, they have to immediately contact their physician because these signs are um, th these signs show uh, a high uh, blood sugar level. Complications of diabetes. Um, so when we have high blood sugar level. Um, um, this high blood sugar level can hurt our organs. Um, it can hurt our nervous system, our kidneys, our heart, our brain. Uh, it can hurt our eyes, um, our teeth. It can hurt our vascular system. And um, also it can cause foot damage. So uh, I'm sure you have heard of diabetic foot. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, complications um, uh, when we get diabetes. Uh, so even if uh, somebody finds out that they have diabetes, it's uh, um, it's important to manage uh, diabetes with medication, with lifestyle uh, changes. Um, but uh, yeah, there are complications to the disease as well. Okay, so now we can, we're coming to talk about risk factors for developing diabetes. Um, I think I mentioned in one of the slides that there are modifiable and non-modifiable uh, factors um, that play a role in development of diabetes. Uh, the non-modifiable ones are the genetic ones. We cannot really do anything about it. Uh, uh, but there are um, factors that we can change, lifestyle factors such as diet, exercise habits, and stress management. Uh, we're going to learn about different risk, risk factors now. So one of them is family history. Uh, as uh, Misha and Stephen and uh, some of um, you know, some uh, some of the other participants mentioned, uh, we have if we have family history, we have higher risk for developing diabetes, uh, especially if it's our parents, our siblings, um, our grandparents. We have higher risk for developing diabetes, and we have to be careful about the things that we can change. Right? We cannot change our family history, but we can change our diet or uh, exercise routine and um, our stress management mechanisms. Um, another factor that can affect our diabetes risk is age. As we get older, we're at higher risk for developing diabetes and we have to be more careful with our um, diet and uh, exercise routine and stress management and the, the lifestyle factors that we can change. Gender. So surprisingly here, um, uh, a lot of the time people think that females have higher risk for developing diabetes, but according to evidence, uh, uh, men have higher risk for developing diabetes than women. Uh, however, um, if a woman gets uh, diabetes during pregnancy, then their risk for developing diabetes is higher than men. Um, so if uh, someone for any reason had previous high blood sugar level, um, then the risk for developing diabetes is higher. Uh, when I say any reason, it could be they had a blood test um, and um, they, they, they noticed they have a high blood sugar level, but they don't have diabetes. It was for any reason. Or they got um, diabetes during pregnancy. It was temporary. It went away, but it's still um, they have higher risk for developing type 2 diabetes. Or during an illness because of a medication or something, they got a higher blood sugar level and it, it got better after the illness, um, still they have higher risk for developing type two diabetes and they have to be careful uh, about their lifestyle factors. Uh, we mentioned this a lot, diabetes during pregnancy increases uh, women's risk for developing uh, type two diabetes later. So they have to be careful with their Um, giving birth to a baby with large body weight can put women at uh, more risk for developing diabetes. Um, education is another risk factor for developing diabetes. The lower the level of education, the higher um, the risk for developing diabetes. Uh, a lot of the time um, uh, with the clients that you work with, they might uh, face language barrier. They might have lower education level. So that it may it uh, put them at higher risk for developing diabetes. 
income level is another uh, important risk factor for developing diabetes. The lower the level of income, um, the uh, less um, choices we have in terms of healthy eating, or physical activity, or even stress. Uh, people might have to work um, two shifts, to um, do two jobs to um, uh, to have a better income. So it put them at higher risk for developing diabetes. Consuming tobacco is another risk factor for developing diabetes. Uh, okay, so I have blood pressure here and cholesterol on the other slide. So I'm gonna talk about both of them together. Um, oops, sorry. Okay, so if we have uh, high blood pressure and high cholesterol level, uh, we are very likely to uh, get diabetes as well. Um, these uh, all kind of come together. So we have high blood pressure, high cholesterol level. We have to be careful um, and to um, prevent diabetes. Um, and uh, we have to manage the cholesterol level and blood pressure. Okay, another interesting risk factor. Um, skipping meals and long gaps can increase our risk for developing diabetes. A lot of the time, people might think that um, by skipping meals, they are uh, losing weight um, and it's going to help them with diabetes prevention. But in fact, um, skipping meals might um, uh, kind of mess up with the in insulin production in your body and uh, put us at higher risk for developing diabetes. Um, our uh, dietitian talks about this better. Um, and because uh, uh, there, there are a lot of new things about intermittent fasting and things like that. Um, but uh, there's evidence that shows uh, skipping meals is not good uh, and it puts at, uh, puts at risk for developing diabetes. Diet is another risk factor for developing diabetes. Um, if we don't eat healthy, uh, we're gonna have higher risk for developing diabetes. Before I move on to the next one, I um, almost forgot to mention this, but a lot of the time people think that our um, South Asian traditional food is not healthy. Uh, uh, it's not true. Our traditional food is very healthy. We just need to be careful about the portions that we eat. Uh, and uh, th this is another topic to talk about healthy eating, how to eat, um, what to eat. Uh, but we can make our own traditional food um, in a way that it's healthy and helping us um, lose weight and stay healthy. So this one is co a controversial sentence. I'm gonna ask this and I want everyone um, to try to participate. Eating sugar causes diabetes. Is it true or false? What do you think? Anybody? Do we have any responses in the chat? Not yet. Okay. I, I would... Oh, go ahead, Steven, Michelle. Go ahead. No, no, Stephen, go ahead. I, I, I was going to say true, or it's not the only factor, but it is one, I would say it's one of the factors. Okay. But that's my guess. It's true. Okay. It's okay. I would say false. It depends on how much sugar you're consuming, which can be the, the cause. Yeah, Maybe. okay. So let's go ahead. Um, Thank you so much for participating. So sugar does not cause diabetes directly, I would say, but like when I say this, I don't mean to go out and eat sugar a lot. Uh, sugar can um, uh, change how our body works. It can uh, make us gain weight and have higher waist circumference. And that's the risk factor for developing diabetes. But uh, if you eat sugar and you have a normal body um, function, uh, so you eat a lot of sugar and then your insulin is there. The insulin, the pancreas will have insulin and insulin will regulate the amount of sugar that goes into, goes into the cells. And then the extra uh, sugar will be, you know, out of your body. Everything would work okay. Um, so it's not going to cause diabetes directly, but it can make you gain weight and that gaining weight can cause other risk factors as well. Uh, it can cause insulin resistance as well. And then uh, it may lead us to diabetes. Physical activity is another risk factor for developing diabetes. If we have a sedentary lifestyle, we have a higher risk for developing diabetes. 
abdominal obesity and body mass index. Uh, so the um, the fat around our belly area it can uh, increase our risk for developing uh, um, diabetes. Uh, w when we do our diabetes risk assessment, this is one of the uh, measurements that we do, the waist circumference, to see um, uh, if uh, people have higher risk for developing diabetes. Okay, so now we come to resettlement or moving to Canada. I think we mentioned this, we talked about it. Uh, when we um, come to uh, Canada as newcomers, um, and uh, when your clients are new here, uh, they're newcomers, uh, they go through a lot of stress, they cannot find uh, the healthy food choices that are, they used to, um, they, uh, go, um, they go through language barrier, communication issues, uh, they cannot access um, a lot of services, so uh, their risk for developing diabetes is much higher. My colleague Neelam is going to talk about this more, so I don't want to uh, uh, talk about this more. Uh, another factor is depression. Uh, mental health issues can put us at higher risk for developing diabetes, uh, which uh, now I can hand it to Neelam, uh, who's going to talk about stress management and mental health and things like that. Um, thank you, Neelam. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Masima. Okay. Awesome. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, you guys learned about diabetes awareness in terms of like what are the modifiable, non-modifiable risk factors, how um, our program functions. So South Asian Diabetes Prevention Program caters to all South Asians uh, in the GTA. And uh, if you are interested, uh, you can connect with us and um, we can discuss more and tailor the program based on your audience. So what makes our program much uh, focused is we are culturally relevant and we support language specific programs. So let's say sometimes it does happen that in a group, we have clients who speak Dari, who speaks Gujarati and who speaks Hindi in the same group. And we try to figure out um, in-house, like I speak Hindi, Gujarati, Masuma speaks Dari, and we also have access to interpreters. So they come over and cater the program. Um, I know that you all will agree that how important is providing a language specific support, um, especially in diabetes prevention, especially for newcomers. When they come in, uh, we need to support in that language which they understand. So uh, you can always connect with us and you know we can discuss more. Moving on to the stress management part of the program. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Awesome. So for stress management, um, I was chatting this uh, in the group chat that in 2009, when the program uh, was uh, born, at uh, that time, stress management wasn't that big part of the program. And um, physical activity, diet, all different sort of factors which are important was part of it. And over time, uh, we have realized that there's so much evidences, so much research which shows that stress management is important factor for diabetes prevention and not only for diabetes prevention, also for other illnesses. So we as service providers, we can uh, learn, we can be aware, and at the same time, we can support our clients as well to understand how they can cope with stress management. So in today's um, session, we'll learn about the prevalence of stress in newcomers and the healthy immigrant effect. We learn about mental health, mental illness, and stress. These terms are often very misunderstood or combined, so we'll just uh, clarify those. Uh, we'll discuss about pre-immigration, post-immigration stressors, and barriers for newcomers in accessing mental health support. Role of stress and cortisol level on development of diabetes. How service providers can help clients reduce stressors by adopting a holistic approach and then stress management for us. So let's start. Let's start with seeing some stats together. So the stats are on mental health and well-being of recent immigrants in Canada. And here you can see that 29% of immigrants reported having emotional problems and 16% reported high level of stress. 
And you can understand that there are so many cases which goes unreported as well, right? So knowing these numbers, we understand that how important it is for us as a service provider to understand the stats. Most of them like gender, immigration category, region of origin, income, perception of settlement process, um, with mental health well-being and being outcome for the recent immigrants, all those are the reasons. Results suggest that females were more likely to report experiencing emotional problems and uh, depression than men. As for high level of stress, immigrants from North America and all Europe were less likely to rate most days as very or extremely stressful than immigrants from Asia and Pacific. And we as service providers, we know that there are so many factors for our clients who are newcomers from Asia and Pacific. Um, so a little bit talking about healthy immigrant effect. You guys might have heard about this already. And what this effect is that in 2009, when this program was born, uh, it was a diabetes prevention program. So South Asian diabetes prevention program. And this article came out in 2010 a year after and um what it showed is one of our dietitian uh, in dubala um she was assessing our clients during that time and so many uh, times it happened that we learned that clients who came the newcomers who came to canada they were all well we all do a medical test before coming to Canada, and that's how we get a green light to enter the country. So we know that their medical tests were all good. But then after coming to Canada, their health status deteriorated. It went down. And there are so many factors uh, which caused this. So there was this article out there, and we were so happy to um, be a part of this program where we know that there is this healthy immigrant effect where the immigrants come in healthy and then over time their health goes down and how we can support them. So we need to understand and we also can support them in understanding that it's not all bad. There are programs like diabetes prevention. There are programs which can support you in all different ways. So let's move on to talking about most important thing mental health. When we talk about mental health, um, anyone who would like to share what you think mental health is, you can unmute yourself. Uh, just your version of mental health. What do you think about mental health? So for me, mental health is um, not necessarily my overall emotions day to day, but just my overall contentment with life. Um, if something bad happens, is it a catastrophe or am I just able to see it as, okay, today was a bad day and overall I feel good. Um, and I think so many people, I'm really glad we're talking about this because it's so missed. Even as a physiotherapist, a lot of people with physical pain and injuries actually have a huge mental health component to developing it. And they're not aware of that connection until we, you know, I talk about it or we talk about it. So um, right. I, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for participating. And you're right. It refers to our emotional and psychological well-being, right? So how we see our mental state. Um, it's helpful to think mental health as a continuum, right? It's a range of mental health wellness to not so feeling well. So it's always a range. During COVID, we used to have the sessions and we used to ask clients to grade how they feel. Do they feel okay today or not so okay? And that's completely okay not to feel okay, right? We will have those stages. Each one of us will pass through that stage at some point in our lives and that's completely fine. So if we are able to manage our day-to-day -day life in both good and bad days, that's fine. If not, that's completely okay as well, but that's how we wanna see our mental health and how we see mental illness. So mental illness would be something where it's been diagnosed by the professionals. It's a diagnostic conditions that affects our thoughts and behaviors, right? So it could be anxiety, it could be depression, it could be schizophrenia or so many other mental health issues. Now, when we talk about stress, um, stress is our body's response to pressure and not necessarily that all the stresses are bad, right? That's what we explain our clients that, you know, if you are 
you have exam next day and that's something a good kind of stress and that's that's healthy but if you see a stress which is for a long period of time constantly uh, and that something is a chronic stress which is not good for your health so that's when you want to seek help or do something about it so there are many different situations or life events that can cause stress and it is often triggered when we experience something new or unexpected that threatens our sense of self especially this is what happened with all of us during covid everything was so uncertain and especially for our clients newcomers there are so many unknown factors uh, that stress is a biggest factor for them um there are so many stressors uh, in our lives and if we especially talk about our clients, what are some stressors um, in newcomers? Uh, you can use a chat box for this one. So I would like to know from you, what do you think, what could be the pre-migration stressors? Some examples. What sort of stressors could be for our clients uh, in the pre-migration stressor phase? So uh, what do you think about it? You can use the chat box. Yeah, leaving family or community behind. Uncertainty, yes, for sure, that's a big one. Unsure about jobs or leaving situation, yes, for sure. Yeah, and, and that's completely true, right? So all those factors before migration, so, and it really depends on case to case. So if it's a family members accompanying with kids, the stressors might be so different. They don't know what school and then what services, all different sort of factors. So these are mostly pre-migration stressors, uh, which our clients could face. And now let's talk about post-migration stressors. So post-migration, meaning when they're already here and what are some stressors they could face? What do you guys think? After coming to Canada. I'm sure there are a lot of them. Un unemployment, yes, for sure. Unmatched expectations, yes, very big one. Lack of social support, cultural shock, immigration status, yes. Precarious housing, yeah. You guys are putting such a good point and these are very important stressors and a big one for all our clients. Uh, thank you all for participating, yes. So post-migration stressors and uh, the pre-migration and post-migration stressors are some very specific ones for our clients who are newcomers to Canada. And um, we will talk about how we can support our clients uh, in managing stress. All right, I'm just gonna move this a little bit here so I can see, okay. So in terms of our body's response to stress, when you connect with your clients and when you talk about stress management, it's so important for them to even realize sometimes even ourselves, we are in stress and we don't realize uh, it's so much uh, hidden that physical factors like fever, which we can measure, we can see it, we can measure it, but something like stress, which is within our minds, it's hard to measure. So it's sort of important for our clients to understand and even as service providers for us to let them know, are they in really stress and what happens to them? So our bodies are very well equipped to handle stress in small doses, which we know and which we talked about. But when that stress becomes a long-term or chronic, it can even have serious impact on our body. And it could have muscle tension, headaches, migraines, and other form of chronic pains. It could be lead to asthma, COPD, or panic attacks or it could be a high blood pressure, heart attack, or in critical terms like stroke, and then diabetes, obesity, depression, and immune disorders. This could be a bodily response to stress. One of our clients in our program, they asked that, oh, does uh, really like depression or panic attacks could you know, cause diabetes? And yes, uh, these are some symptoms which our body's response to stress and which in turn, can lead to diabetes. So this all are the responses to stress. Now, if we talk about diabetes development, how stress can lead to diabetes. Um, in last 
five to 10 years, I would say there's so much evidence is now and so much more needs to be done. Uh, but we have enough evidence which shows that stress and depression can lead to diabetes. And what happens is in response to stress, our body releases cortisol and adrenaline, which is our hormones, a stress hormone, and high level of stress hormones can stop insulin to work properly. And that can lead to insulin resistance. We know that glucose uh, can get into our cells and increase the blood sugar levels. That's uh, when Massimo showed the key slides. Uh, that's what happens uh, when the insulin resistance takes place. And then one of the factors is overeating and stress, uh, which could lead to type 2 diabetes. Um, when we talk about what are the barriers newcomers face in accessing mental health supports, um, there are so many. And I know that as a service provider, you would have so many points here to add. And some of the points... Uh, which we came up with is unfamiliarity or a discomfort with the medical system. There's so much confusion in terms of what could be the first step, how to access the support, how to talk to somebody and understanding that coming from a South Asian culture, there's so much stigma already attached to accessing the support. So being unfamiliar, not so comfortable with the medical system, lack of cultural sensitive care, that could be something. I know that many of our uh, programs, we have ladies and they prefer female caregivers or some service providers. Just gonna move this here. Lack of mental health and other support service awareness. And then mental health stigma, which is the big one. So these are some barriers our clients could face in accessing mental health supports. Uh, one of um, the problem or the barrier which we come across all the time is the mental health stigma, um, not being aware. So they are into anxiety. They have depression, but they're not aware of those symptoms. They're not aware of the sensitivity or how much important that is. And we can support them by providing programs like this, by providing them that information that what you're facing is not something normal. It's not something, okay, you need to take steps towards it. And that's completely okay to ask for help. So those are some barriers we can talk about. I'm going to move to the next one. So how we can support newcomers to manage their stress and mental health? And many of these points we do implement in our program. First is, as we can do as a service provider is assessment. If we are a physiotherapist, if we are nurses, or if we are physicians, um, if we are service providers, any sort of uh, in the healthcare industry, I, I know that all of us, we've been taught that assessment is the very first step to support our clients. And assessment could be identifying and prioritizing their needs. It could be physical, social, mental, and then determining the existing support. Do they have support from their family? Do they have support from their friends, from their community? Especially when we talk about mental health support, um, one strong thing about our culture is we do take pride that we have close social groups very strong cultural bonds. We look forward to our family for support. And sometimes it's a good thing, but what happens is if it needs a professional help or support, then they need to understand that it's okay to ask for help, to go out and seek that professional help. So first is assessment. And then second is enhancing protective factors. And what that means is exploring supports with clients which they may find helpful. So for example, sometimes in our program, we see all different sort of um, our clients, uh, their needs are very different. So um, I cannot suggest same sort of plan to everybody. It will be a very unique sort of plan for each client, depending on what sort of help they need. So we need to identify that and then enhance that support. So exploring with clients what might be helpful for them. So co-developing a plan to enhance supports in their lives. This could be addressing different social determinants of health.